Hey guys, this is Spinda from GrinderSchool.com uh, with part three of my live play series after my lecture series. Uh, this week we're going to talk all about uh, the power of position in No Limit Hold'em, uh, specifically small stick sticks max no limit. Uh, and like, just kind of give you a refresher on what we talked about last week. Uh, our goal in this video is going to be to play very tight from out of position uh, and very loose. Um, when we're in position. So just getting off the bat, obviously this is going to be a pretty easy fall with 8-5 offsuit, but it'll be a very easy fall with a lot of marginal hands that might appear good enough to people. 7-8 offsuit, 5-6 suited, um, you know, ace-9. Ace a lot of hands that may look like uh, they're playable in this spot certainly uh, become unplayable because of the fact that our pro opponent's opening on the button. He's going to have position the entire way in the hand, and that's just going to make it very tough for us to play profitably. So what we want to do is analyze some spots throughout this video where position has either helped or hurt a player being in or out of position. Um, and we'll talk about how our opponents are not exploiting their position. Like we've already seen Martin Bonda um, limp on the button. We know that while uh, it's not an aggressive play, at least he's playing on from position. However, we'd much rather see him uh, raise the button there to, to fully you know, exploit his advantage and start building a bigger pot. And this is an interesting hand already. Uh, the preflop, preflop went call and the big blind check, and then he led the flop, and then he checked the turn. So our opponent got a lot of information on our opponent's possible hands um, from his actions. He got to see him bet the flop, and then he got to see his opponent check the turn, and then check call, which is a fairly weak play, and then check the river. So more than likely, our opponent, um, more likely to play on the button, uh, could have used that all that information to his advantage, whereas this player really had a very uh, a small amount of information to go off on. All right, so with Jack then suited, it's a spot where um, we won't be folding for 25 cents, and this should hopefully give us a chance to talk about uh, how tough it is to play maybe some drawing type hands when we're out of position. That's a good spot where um, this could show how tough it is to play uh, certain hands. And here I'm definitely going to isolate. Obviously I'll be betting here. We can see already what happened. By being out of position, I wasn't able to maybe protect my hand on the flop. Um, not that I would have been going for a check raise on the street. Uh, but also I might have lost some value out of my hand. Here I'm going to definitely bet to get value maybe out of straights. And hopefully some worse flushes. If I get raised here, uh, it stinks. I think his range. Huh. I think he bets raises a nine on the turn. So it's better flushes. And you can see how being out of position put me in a tough spot here. Um, And I guess I can just hope that he's raising straights here crazily. But this is a spot where I've lost control of the pot. I'm playing a big pot with, I guess, not too weak of a hand. Um, but a hand I'd much rather maybe a pot control in the river. Yeah, so he makes the nut flush. Unfortunately, we both get there on the end. Um, but you can see how uh, him being in position allowed him to get full value on the river, where he was able to raise the river for value. And it's just unfortunate that that river card came. But that shows you why when we're not making like nut hands out of position, we're going to get value talent a lot. And so he took position to his advantage there on the river by raising and gaining extra value out of his hand. We will be isolating a ton from the button in the cutoff. Um, you can see how on that last spot, too, being out of position cost me. Because if I had led the flop, he's definitely folding. Um, however, the fact that the flop checked through and I bet the turn, he was able... Um, to get you know get his hit his draw rather cheaply we talked about hitting hidden draws uh and you know that's just the quirks of being out of position and not betting the flop there so we'll definitely be trying to raise a ton from their position. Here's a spot where, against this player, he seems kind of passive. I know he did raise that other street. Uh, it's a spot where we can do one of two things. We can bet the flop, looking to go to a cheap showdown, or we can just go ahead and pot control the flop, 
and if he's an aggressive player, chances are he'll be betting the turn a lot. And we can do what we tried to do earlier, which was snap off a bluff we talked about in the video. Um, and we'll see if we actually snapped off a bluff on the turn. Uh, uh, either way, we control the pot the way we wanted to, and I don't feel like there's much value here. Okay, so we, he's flatting with king-queen out of position, and you can see how little value he got out of trip queen. So that's another reason to show you why um, being in position is just uh, so important. Right, he got very minimal value out of three queens, um, which is what happens when you play the majority of your hands when you're out of position. Here's a board that's a little more coordinated. I'm going to definitely go ahead and continuation bet this flop. Uh, and we'll take it from there. We get called, and uh, that's a good and bad turn card. I'm going to go ahead and bet. Protect my hand against hands like they have a random 10 in them, 8, 10, 9, 10. Uh, and obviously, I can easily fold if I get check raised. Um, and I'm value counting worse hands, and I'm looking to take a free showdown. But if I get check raised, I'm obviously going to be folding the hand. And we go and fold. We go and get folds out of him. Uh, here. Pretty easy squeeze spot with the rockets. Oh, you called, didn't you? This is a pretty easy bet call. I'm going to bet like $4 make you holla. Maybe let him get it in pretty weak here. I expect to have the best hand 100% of the time. And ship it for a nice little pot. Um, you can see there, we definitely want to be aggressive when we're out of position. And he had diamonds. Wow, he flopped pretty big there, actually. Okay, so there's a spot where we're in position. Our opponent uh, calls a raise, uh, and then he checks. So he took a little bit of time to check, and that's one of the things we want to talk about were timing tells. And I think when he thinks a while before he checks, he's never going to check. He's rarely going to check fold when that happens. So... Um, I'm just going to take a look at a free card here. Uh, he checks twice, which is interesting, which means I'm going to go ahead and bet the, the turn now. Um, when he checks twice, this is just a benefit of being in position. Uh, you know, really wasn't seeing the old check raise coming. Uh, therefore, it's a pretty easy fold now. Excuse me. Um, but the spot where I think it's a pretty cool spot where he checks twice. I never really would expect him to be check raising when he's checking twice. Uh, so I go ahead and I'm expecting to check fold a lot when he checks the flop. But our timing tell was, looks like it's correct that when he checks, when he takes a little while to check the flop, he usually has a pretty airy hand. Definitely be see betting this flop, um, potentially getting worse hands to fold. Uh, I know he's calling with like some middling Broadway hands, uh, etc. This is really interesting what he would actually check raise this flop with. This is a spot where. Uh, if I had more of a read on this player, I could certainly see myself calling here to float and expecting him to check fold the turn a lot. Um, I would expect, like, uh, the only hands in his range to be doing this for value would be, like, ace-jack. I've already seen him cold call king-queen out of position, so I can certainly feel like he has a hand like, he could have a hand like ace-jack in his range here. Um, however, against this guy, I think what we did on that other street is going to be more correct, where uh, we check back the flop pot controlling a little bit against him and allowing him to bet on the turn. Probably have a pretty aggressive image, but a losing one at that on this table. These players seem pretty loose. So here we're out of position. It's not a great spot, obviously. Um, this is obviously a pretty nice flop, though. Uh, and we'll talk about like this spot. Okay, so this is where poker gets a little tough. Um, as long as he does it on the nut flush, I'm never in that bad of shape. I mean, I guess I'm in pretty bad shape if he has a set, but so be it. Okay, so my opponents are doing really good at flopping huge against me, and that's a spot where I got it in with about 30% equity, and that's why being out of position is tough. Um, of course, I had about. 17 outs on the river, but it didn't hit. Um, but that's just a spot where 
uh, being out of position is tough. Like I automatically, I lose control of the pot and we can see how that's a pretty tough spot. Um, you know, at higher levels, my opponent's certainly capable of raising a lot worse hands than just flushes on that flop. Uh, however, I guess at this level, it may not be the case. Obviously, though, I mean, I'm not going to play tight to the point where I'm um, folding hand like two kings in only position. There's a spot where I'm going to lead instead of uh, check because... I feel like my opponents are checking back a lot. I flopped a pretty big hand, and I don't mind getting the money in on the flop. You can see how being out of position has already caused us to lose control of the pot and stack off with marginal holdings. So even though I don't like losing money, I mean, luckily at this level, the money doesn't really mean anything, but... Um, but it just goes to show you how I stacked off with like 30% equity because I was out of position where in position, I'm not sure how much differently that hand would play out. I'd probably get check raised a lot, uh, but I just feel like I can manipulate the size of the pot a little bit better in those spots. So, And I just don't think I'm ever going to be incorrect to be stacking off there with like, um, you know, the king I flush and overpair on that board texture. My opponent can be raising a lot worse, a lot of worse hands. Um, you know? So here's a spot where we'll definitely be betting multiple streets. Our opponent's thinking for a while, so if he does call, we can easily put him on more of a marginal strength hand. And if he were to call and check raise later, it'd be much easier to put him on more of a stronger hand, uh, because it looks like he maybe was thinking between calling and raising on the flop compared to calling and folding. Uh, if he raises later. So using those timing tells, we could use those timing tells certainly to our advantage on later streets. So, I mean, I'll play loose both in both in position and out of position in this video. I'm not going to try to play ridiculously loose out of position because I just would rather not get, you know, owned here. Obviously, I was going to call this raise, uh, but now I'll just fold. To the appropriately sized three bet there. Probably can make it even smaller with the stack size. Doesn't necessarily have to be making it uh, more, you know, 3x. But it's interesting. We'll see how position could help this guy maybe play the spot properly or not. I would probably need another player to come along to play this 8-9 suited profitably from the small blind. And once again, we want to be playing pretty tight when we're out of position. So uh, the spot where I, I think this kind of guy is never really folding to a 3-bet, um, which means I'm just going to tend to take more of a value 3-betting range against him. In the spirit of playing ridiculously loose in position, I'll open any two suited cards on the button. It's a pretty good spot to see bet. Um, obviously, we don't have really much equity at all, and it's a pretty dry board. So. And we get folds. Yay, position. So, you know, one way to just to kind of figure out how much better position is, is obviously to play a ton of hands from position. I'd rather do that. <laughs> then um, play a really wide range out of position just to understand how awful it is <laughs> when we're playing out of position. Um, so, you know, to keep those things in mind uh, that, uh, you know, if you're trying to learn how much better position is, let's start off by playing a ton of our range from position, you know, in position. So, so far, so bad. We're getting successfully owned by the 25 no limit fishes. But um, I think we've already seen it a couple of times now how we've lost control of pots or we've lost, you know, on this table twice now, being out of position. The two biggest spots we've lost has been when we've been out of position on this table. 
uh, and uh, I think that's just that's great for the video's sake, and hopefully for you know the, all the viewers out there to realize that um, you know I mean we just just how important position is. Um, Here's a spot where if this guy limps in like he has been, this will be the first time I won't raise up the blinds. So uh, we can also talk about um, free betting in position. Uh, I'm not going to do a jack dude. I'm going to do it with a little better hand. But when we're free betting light, and you'll hear it's kind of you know new fads all over the place. It's not that new, but you know certainly free betting light is a big part of playing a little bit better at higher stakes. Um, we all, we want to start by three betting light in position, um, not out of position. I see too many people three betting light out of position to start, and that's just a really easy way to get owned in like three bet pots is to be constantly playing them out of position. Uh, you know, therefore, um, when you start three betting light, or if you want to start opening up your three betting range a little bit, you really want to make sure you do it in position first. And the best spots to do are going to be when the cutoff opens and you're on the button. There's really no better spot than that. We know the cutoff will have a slightly wider range than his earlier position range, if not a very much wider range. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we're going to have position the rest of the way against him. So uh, there's a couple things that usually will happen. One is he'll just fold a ton free flop, which, to be honest, isn't that incorrect uh, from him. Like he he sh really shouldn't be um, he really shouldn't be looking to call a ton of three bets out of position. And the second thing he'll do is he'll call too much. <laughs> and uh, effectively, like here's a spot with a little bit better, uh, hand that plays a little bit better, I would certainly think about three betting there. Um, he'll call too much when he's out of position, and he'll have to play a lot of three bet pots when he, you know, from out of position, which is just a really, obviously a pretty bad situation. Um, so keep those things in mind in terms of you know, when you want to open your three betting game up, you want to open your preflop aggression up, you always want to do it when we have position on our opponents. Obviously, we're just going to be constantly opening the button when we get a hand as strong as ace queen suited. I mean, that's just an added bonus. But our button and cutoff range is obviously going to be very, very wide for this video. Um, probably, if I look at it later, hopefully something in like the 60 or 70 percent range. Um, a little bit, a little bit of it depends on how loose the players are on our left, uh, in terms of more in the cutoff, how loose the button is. But um, you know, the majority of the time we're going to be uh, calling it. I mean, uh, we're going to be opening a ton on the button and as much as we can on the cutoff. Uh, this is a spot where calling a 3-bet would be pretty bad. I really don't like your 3-bet size. I think it's way too big. Um, I could 4-bet bluff here, but uh, this is his first 3-bet at the table, so I'm just going to have to give him credit. But certainly that wouldn't be the worst spot uh, to 4-bet bluff, cutoff versus button. Just for what I just said, it's really easier for people to be 3-betting the cutoff light um, from the button. I just need the ace-3 hearts over here. Maybe we can look at this pot to see how position played out in this one. Interesting small river bet. Looks like he's going for some thin value. Um, maybe out of like a, a mediocre flush or like going really thin with like ace queen or something. Um, I have to look at the hand history to see how that hand played out because I, to be honest, I wasn't paying attention. That was an interesting river bet. Um, who raised pre flop? Bet the flop. Bet four on the turn and then check fold to the river. That's kind of interesting. Uh, so the thing we see from who is uh, that being out of position didn't allow him to see a free showdown, even though he bet the flop and turn, which is a good way to charge your opponent who's drawing against you possibly. Um, you're still not guaranteed to see a free showdown uh, when you're opening, you know, when you're out of position. Um, I guess I could bring the replayer in here, uh, but it kind of plays it fast sometimes. Um, but you'll see he raises preflop, he calls, and bets the flop, bets the turn, and then check folds the river, um, which just goes to show you that when you're out of position, it's just really hard to see a free showdown, or a cheap showdown. And with a shorter stack on the button, I'm not going to open this hand.
So there's another another type of hand that I was talking about, I think, in the video that really improves um, with position. Like, it's a really tough hand to play out of position. I think, luckily, this player is pretty tight and straightforward. Obviously, he stacked this one's flatting a hand like Jackson suited in position. That doesn't really tell us a whole lot about his style. Cause that's a pretty, you know, obvious common flat there. Um, This is kind of an interesting spot where um, we have a pretty aggressive opponent on a pretty draw heavy board. Uh, it might really behoove us here against this type of player to check back this flop and to analyze the turn card, especially the timing he took on the flop. And that's a great turn card, obviously, for our hand. Um, so we'll definitely be batting here if he checks again. And the question is whether we want to raise or not uh, if he calls. I mean, if we want to call if he raises here on the turn, but uh, yeah, it's just a, a spot where I could bet multiple streets to protect my hand, um, but against an aggressive player, I'm going to tend to check back that flop and see the turn card. Against a more passive player, I certainly want to bet the flop there. Hmm. Not that I want to get into a three betting war, a 25 to limit on a video, but this is twice now. Uh, a spot with like ace-five suited, I'd probably be calling here and looking to play a three-bet pot in position. But ace-five offsuit, unfortunately, is just way too weak to be calling three bets with. I'd rather have a hand like seven-eight suited or something. So there's a few things we can do when we have an aggressive player on our left. Uh, one is going to be to tighten up our preflop range. Or two is going to be to fight fire with fire. Um, and it's kind of up to us what we want to do. So there's a pretty cool spot. Uh, he took a little while before checking. Obviously, I'm going to be making a larger C-bet on a draw-heavy board. Um, unfortunately, he just check folds. It's good to run like me sometimes. When you flop an overpair with a flush draw, they have a flush... We flop a set, and they check fold. Uh, he like insta check this flop, so I'm gonna assume my king high is the best hand a lot of the time, and just go ahead and protect my hand against like random small spades, or just any two free cards. Um, and once again, there's some information I gained by his timing. So like here's a hand I might normally open, but this guy's been three betting a lot and just doesn't want to seem to give up uh, like his blinds to us, so exploiting that, and I mean, obviously I hadn't seen this player open yet, but a um, way to exploit that is just to tighten up, and then also to stack off just slightly lighter preflop. Yeah, he's just very loose. Uh, here, this guy doesn't have enough money to run a bluff or anything on him. Mm -mm, this wouldn't be a bad card just to shove on. Obviously that I have six high. I doubt he was even fold a king. Uh, so here's a spot multi way. They both check fairly quickly. However, it's a spot where I really don't expect to get both players to fold. Um, I'd take a free card with a hand like maybe queen eight suited, also seven eight, looking to hit a gutter ball. Um, it's a spot where also with like nine x against an aggressive player, I might find myself checking back the flop a lot. Uh, they both check twice, which is some information I gained from checking the flop. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and bet this turn. I don't expect to get called in either spot too much, and obviously I expected to hit a straight, um, so this is a pretty no-brainer. And there's an advantage of position. <laughs> I got, uh, I hit a hidden draw for one, um, which is awesome, and uh, I got maximum value out of my hand. My opponent had two fours, so I was even value betting uh, the turn. Sick call in the river. You just don't like money, sir. The only explanation. Uh, here's a spot where if another player calls, I'd probably call it the A6 suited, but once again, okay, I'm going to call now. I'll, uh, it's a pretty good hand for a multi-way pot. It's a pretty good spot to lead again, and I'll probably be jamming over a raise. So you can just see how being out of position forces me to play my hand a little more face up than I would normally like to. 
Uh, and typically, although I'm going to have a pretty balanced range there for leading, um, a lot of people won't, and that's how you get exploited by having unbalanced ranges where, like, your leading range is something in the neighborhood of, like, 7x or nothing, unfortunately. I mean, not nothing. I mean, 7x, and there's nothing else in your range there. Um, and I think that's pretty incorrect. So uh, that's why a better player can play, I guess, less incorrectly out of position than a worse player, but it's still hard to play profitably when you're in position. So this is cool though. I mean, I've really enjoyed this lecture series so far in terms of just focusing on one key concept and really like talking about it. I mean, you guys get a lot out of the videos, I'm hoping, but I also um, refresh a lot of key basics in my mind that maybe from time to time uh, I find myself straying away from, like playing too loose out of position, getting into three bet wars when I'm out of position and stuff like that. And uh, I think making these videos has helped keep me grounded in a sense. Like here's a hand I would normally open. Obviously not now. I could flatter three bet. Um, Certainly could 3-bet here, but I have a really short stack in the blinds, and that's going to stink when, like, 20% of the 15% of the time or so, he picks up a hand he's willing to felt. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to fold for 25 cents at min-raise with a suited hand. Um, let's run the math. I'm getting 2.5 to 1. I need 4 to 1, but he's a short stacker, so maybe if I hit, he'll leave. <laughs> that's, like, my reasoning. Brick, brick. Um, that's just fun poker there. It's a dollar stack. Whatever. Uh, I had seven out, so I was almost getting the right price. I guess a well, actually, I'm probably going to open this against this guy if it folds to me. If he min raises the button, I might stick him in too with the old ace high. Now I'm just going to fold. No, no, I'm going to raise daisy. I know this guy's limping a lot worse than ace high on the button. Um. So we'll just be sticking it on on any flop. This is as good as any, really. Except he's going to have, like, king two. Oh, please get there. Yes, ship it. Die rat holding scum. That's not nice, but I'm going to say it anyway. Oh, sweet. Ship the three outer. Um... No, it's just pretty standard. I, it's amazing that he's limping king-queen suited on the button. Uh, not as much amazing as it is, just typical of a really bad per player. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left in this video. But, uh, so, let's see. Let's talk more about position. Uh, I was getting into quite a rant about 3-betting, uh, and unfortunately we haven't really seen me play a 3-bet pot in position yet. Um... Because I think at this level, it's just somewhat unnecessary to be getting in like these three betting battles. Um, like this would be a pretty good spot because this guy's been opening just an absolute ton on my big blind, uh, and I haven't three bet him yet this whole session. So now he's going to play a three bet pot out of position against me, which is pretty interesting. Uh, this is a spot where I just don't have to bet big at all. Um, something like what I raised with preflop is plenty big enough as a C bet on a dry board in a three bet pot. Ah, it's not a good card to barrel. I was going to barrel a big card. Um, unfortunately, this card gives him a lot of pairs. Uh, hands like 8, 9. Uh, it also completes some straights or some gutter balls you might have called with. So, uh, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to check this one back and maybe bank a queen every once in a while. I have a pair now. But I really doubt he's ever going to check this river to me after, the flop, after I check back the turn. Which means I could easily... Uh, run a goofy line where I check back the turn with like aces or kings or something or a set and then just jam this river and it would make zero sense to him. Um, but you can see how if he had a big hand, if he flopped a big hand, he lost a lot of value out of it. There's going to be a lot of turn cards where I was probably going to be successful enough to buff barrel him off on the turn. So the fact that he just called a three bet out of position is going to be a pretty much a losing play unless he's exclusively doing it with like pocket queens and better a lot of the time. So here's a hand. This is probably pretty marginal, as um, loose as this guy has been defending against my uh, preflop raises and such. Uh, but I still just can't help myself sometimes, and which is one thing I need to improve on is playing too aggressive when I'm out of position. Callie's new to the table. If he opens, I'll definitely be three betting. I think people make a mistake in making just way too big of three bet sizes in certain spots. Uh, 
so. You know, so be it. And there we go. So there's a great spot where, uh, not a great spot. I mean, that's just a typical spot where a person's calling a three bet when they're out of position and then check folding a lot of flops. Uh, and I think the thing that people uh, lose is when they start three betting in position, they tend to do it with too big of a size. Like you can see here, I've just been doing it 3x, which I think is more than enough. Um, you don't want to make it much bigger because one of the advantages we have when we're in position is that we're able to easily manipulate the size of the pot or control the size of the pot. And if we start three betting to like three and a half or four x, we begin to play more into our opponent's uh, hands by inflating the pot preflop and then like maybe taking away a street of poker or allowing our opponent to easily maybe check raise all in on the flop. Um, instead, we three bet like smallish, like three x is about as big as I'll go in position because I'm going to be three betting with a very wide range. Uh, which will then enable me to put a lot of pressure on the flop turn and river. Um, I'll have multiple streets to work with, which is exactly what I want to be doing. So once again, like you can see, every time I three bet in position, it's been like 3x. And then out of position, is going to be like 3.5x, unless there's a cold call or two, and then I'll be making it slightly bigger. I can't put that guy hero call with fours on the other hand. That hand back there when I won with a straight. I've been so mad if I had been bluffing with like bricked flush draw or something. Whenever someone sends me a hand history like that, I just always kind of give them the this just in, people aren't good at poker kind of thing. So I'm whispering that to myself at the moment as well. Um, and that's great. I mean, I think one thing we have to remind ourselves constantly is that people really aren't good at this game. Even like the tight regulars at some of these levels uh, are just pretty mediocre at poker. Like they have preflop down um, to maybe not even to the best degree where they're probably still playing too loose out of position or not loose enough in position. So like even the guys you might deem as like regulars in your you know poker tracker database. Uh, you know, really aren't going to be anywhere near the top of the food chain like at small stakes poker. They're just not going to be that great of players. I think I've had Queen 10 suited like 18 times under the gun, and you can see I folded it. Um, it I probably would open it at uh, higher stakes or on a table where my image is slightly less awful, seeing how I am have a losing image on this table. Um, so just once again... Open the button a ton. Uh, I'm not going to 4-bet bluff this hand because the stacks are deeper and it's like perfect stacks for him to like 5-bet shove on me or he's not going to fold a lot of 4-bets if he happens to 3-bet me here. Um, he's just very loose, uh, which is great. He's been playing pretty fit or full post-flop though, so that allows me to probably easily bet this flop and then just give up if he calls or check raises, obviously. But he's just been folding a ton post-flop, so knowing that and seeing him check the flop to me, um, is great. Definitely be isolating the CP limper with the two sevens. This Kenny Tram will call him pocket sevens. And I'm going to get called. Okay, the wrong spot called me. Uh, okay, so here's a cool spot um, where I never expect him to fold a better hand. And he's going to stack off a lot. And he took a little while to check. So I'm going to take my free card on the flop relative to taking it on the turn. Um, because even like flush draws have pretty darn good equity against me. So I'm going to take my freebie. And that's actually a pretty cool card. Um, whereas I should have a lot of ace x hands in my range. Um, it's a spot where I've seen his bet size. I know it's pretty small. Uh, you know, so I'm going to go ahead and like semi bluff the turn here. The problem is if I do this, I lose the ability uh, like to just keep the pot in control. Uh, but obviously, seeing his bet size, seeing him check the flop, I use all that information to my advantage because I was in position. And I couldn't have worked this video out like any better so far. I've stacked off out of position, I've lost big pots out of position, and I've managed to win all the big pots in position. You'd think I would have recorded ahead of time, but I'm just... can't sleep at 4.30 in the morning, so I'm up playing some poker. Oh, the life of being a poker pro. You think for a week you have your sleep schedule back, you're waking up at 8 a.m. every morning, you're going to the gym, you're actually seeing your friends for once, and then all it takes is a bottle, a bottle of Dr. Pepper and a friend going deep in a tournament, and you're back waking up at 4 p.m. and going to bed at 6 a.m. 
<laughs> if you don't want to be a poker pro, uh, I mean, if you don't, if you want to get to sleep at a good hour, my suggestion would be not to be a poker pro, or I guess to have more discipline than me. Jack six, expert sir, expert. I want to get the walk with a big hand for once. Um, let's see how that check six hand went. Match leader, min raise, pre flop. And then just, okay, so this is where he didn't use his position to an advantage in a sense. Um, he flopped bottom set on a really draw heavy board, and he didn't protect his hand. He had a chance to. After the flop went bet and min raise, he really should have just re raised the flop and got the money in. Um, instead, he just flats with bottom set. I'm not sure what he's thinking. Is he thinking his hand's beat and he's trying to improve on the turn, or is he really trying to slow play on this draw heavy of a board texture? Either way, he should have used the fact that he's seen a player bet and a player raise to his advantage, realizing that at least one of them has enough to stack off with, if not both of them, and gotten the money in on the flop. However, he did not do so. So this is what I was talking about. Players who um, may appear to have like taggish stats or may not appear to be too bad, but they just make incorrect plays a lot of the time. Um, so boo. Boo to him. He should have played that better. But um, what are you going to do? So I really haven't decided yet what my next... Uh, part is going to be on. Here's a spot where I'll just be calling in position. Um, obviously, set mining in position is a really uh, pretty profitable. Um, unless we have like a well-known squeezer behind us, um, then it becomes less profitable. But the reasons why set mining is much more profitable in position than out of position, this is probably why I should have flatted aces here if I had them. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this is, wouldn't be the worst spot to back raise if we were only like 20, like 100 big lines deep. Um, but being deeper, it's going to really um, tend to make my equity differential, you know, it's going to tend to exaggerate the fact that I'm not going to have great equity when the money gets in something like 35 to 40%. Um, with this guy on my left, though, I probably should start flatting like bigger pairs there, in a sense, looking to maybe back raise there and look pretty weak. Um, but to get with my point, why set mining in position is so much better than out of position is just because we have the ability uh, to gain all the value we can possibly gain out of a hand. Like I talked about in the lecture, we can use all three streets to our advantage. Um, and that allows us to play good. I have aces like four times this video, and I'm down like 30 bucks. So, congrats. So once again, though, I mean, I, what I'll probably try to do in the last 10 minutes, maybe open up the PT stats and then just observe uh, how loose I played um, in later positions. Here with the short stack on my left, it really limits my options from the cutoff. I'm still going to open this hand, but I'm definitely going to make sure not to be opening to more than three big blinds. Um, because if he's a successful short stack or if he has any clue what he's doing, um, he should be shoving pretty light, cut off versus button opens, and that's why it sucks to have short stackers on your left. And if this wasn't for the sake of the video, I'd probably get up and get to getting on. But um, you know, let's do it and see see what happens here. Like he flats, this is impressive. Like if he's a if he's a professional short stacker, this is always a really big hand, and he did it really quickly. But I'm gonna guess Arnold 1948. Um, looks like he's like a 61 year old nit. Um, uh, here's a spot where I think he'll bet a lot when I check to him. So I'm going to check raise instead of bet. Okay, well, I'm definitely going to check raise this board. And, like, the min bet doesn't mean much to me. And uh, I'm sure he'll have a deuce or a better nine, but whatever. Okay, so we got him to put 20 big blinds in with ace-10 high. And he got there twice. So it's a bit unfortunate, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, whatever. Short stackers. I guess I, the gods got back at me for sucking out on the other short stacker. Whatever. Um, you know, that's a spot where I think, like, on that board texture, if I check, he's always going to bet. I wasn't, I mean, I was pretty sure he was going to bet fold to a 25 cent bet, like when he did that. Um, so I was a little surprised when he stuck it in, but obviously I'm pretty much caught. 
I'm pretty much pot committed at that point. It's like uh, 250 to win, 10. So I'm getting 3 to 1 on my money, um, which means I'm never folding top pair. Uh, expert play by him, though. He's flatting ace 10. I think it was suited. No, it was ace 10 offsuit. So he's obviously not a professional short stacker because a professional short stacker would never. Um, Flat ace and offsuit there. Uh, whereas, like, if I'm playing against, I don't want to toss a few names around, but there are definitely some really, really good short stackers who play just a ton of tables and have poker down pat and, uh, or the, their strategy down pat, and uh, they're certainly never really flatting anything but, like, aces, kings, and queens there. Like, maybe not even queens. Um, so, you know, just. Be careful in that sense of, uh, you know, against the good short stackers when they flatten that spot. Against the bad guys like this, it's just still a wide range, and he just doesn't realize it's pretty incorrect to be flatting, you know, almost 20% of your stack there pre-flop. Uh, not going to do it out of position. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I normally would, <laughs> but for the sake of the video... Right, tight is right out of the out of the blinds, uh, and I probably am using quite a good refresher course. Oh man, nut flush draw and a straight. Why couldn't I have uh, three bet this pot? So here out of position, I'm probably just going to check fold this flop. Um, I expect him to bet a ton, so if I had a big hand, I'd check raise a lot here. Um, because I just expect him not to check back this flop all all that much. Uh, but he does, and that's not really a great turn card. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and still check fold. Uh, if he, like, if he, thanks, stars. Hey, guys, just so you know, the scoop's running during my session. Um, like, this is good. I mean, in terms of him exploiting his position, I've checked twice. I've shown weakness. He definitely should be betting a really wide range there. So hopefully he wasn't just value betting. Like, I mean, I mean, hopefully... You guys will realize when your opponents check twice there, they're generally very weak, and you should be looking to take the pot away a decent amount of the time there. Oh, did Arnold show down on that other pot? Could I have stacked somebody? We had two tens. Sick. I get led into um, on a pretty draw heavy board. Uh, here it'll definitely be. Even though this guy's aggressive, uh, I'm going to be continuation betting this board. Um, he's check raised me once on ace high boards, uh, but. He's also given up a few times here with no equity in position. Uh, I really can't do anything but just fold. So this guy is leading, calling preflop out of the small, out of the big blind, and then leading uh, Jack ten three with two hearts. Uh, not much I can do there, but you know raise my two pair sets, maybe even over pairs and big draws, and then probably just give up or maybe float some more mediocre hands like eight nine or something like that. To be honest, but there's really just not a whole lot I can do in that spot. Uh, when I get let into with a hand like ace nine offsuit, which is like flop absolutely nothing. Um, here I didn't raise with the ace eight offsuit because I'm trying to control the pot as best I can when I'm out of position. Uh, this is kind of interesting. What will happen if he saw me last? He saw me. Okay, last time he saw me check twice and check fold. So let's see. Um, I've checked three times now, and he didn't bet a worse hand. So this is this is what I'm talking about. People that aren't using the information they're gaining uh, from position poker. Right, I've checked three times, so I'm obviously never have any sort of hand, and he just shows down his queen high, uh, which I guess is like the one hand he probably could show down there, to be honest. So like, I wish he was like, I wish he'd shown down, like uh, Jack or ten high or something. That would have been much, much better. Seven deuce suited is whooping pocket aces butt in this video. Just so you all know. Okay. Uh, here would have been a pretty interesting spot uh, had Kali not called, and I wasn't sure if Arnold's probably going to call. Um, so I definitely can call for set value. Uh, and in a multi-way pot, this is actually kind of cool that I have two eights here. I think people are going to play their hand pretty straightforward. Like I really wouldn't expect Boss Poker to see that bluff this flop, and if he is, it's really bad, I think. And once again, by being out of position, my opponent took a free card, and he probably got there on the turn. Or one of them did. I mean, someone has ace X in their hand. So even if he doesn't have an ace, he probably should bet this turn a lot, seeing how we've all checked to him again. Uh, and we get to fold. So you can see how the position, the power position, allowed him to take a free card. 
uh, which then probably allowed him to get there, or at the very least, represent getting there. So, uh, just things could not be working out better to prove my points, but I could not, probably not be running worse. Uh, <laughs> well, well, that's poker. Um, I'll be completing here, definitely. This is just too good of a hand to fold, but I'm not going to be raising. And we'll play a draw out of position, or a drawing type hand. And we'll break. Arnold's like got to have like the nuts here, doesn't he? I mean, he just is really, really passive. Um, and uh, it'd be interesting to see how we'd have to play a flush draw there. So we're going to be raising this guy's limp up a decent amount uh, because we get the information that people just don't really limp that strong in the um, small blind. So this is where I'll probably just flat if Cali opens. Uh, I certainly could re-raise, but I think Ace-Jack plays much better if I just flat here. Who has settled down, definitely, um, since where we started with him, but he's still a little loose. I'd have to look at stats later to get a, to get a complete read on him. Um, Damphian seems kind of loose on this table. But I've just really been playing a ton of hands in position. So, uh, and people really haven't exploited the fact that I'm raising the button a ton. I've got three bet a few times, but like nowhere near enough to make up for the fact that I'm just constantly stealing blinds and C betting and taking down pots post flop. And without that one hand where we got it in with about 30% equity, but probably more like 50% um, equity against a typical range there, uh, you know, had it been for that hand, we'd be up instead of down a little bit. Okay, I've three bet this guy a few times, so really, I'm really hoping he opens the button. It doesn't. Uh, small blind versus big blind, I'm definitely opening 4x. Uh, and it's going to be really hard for me to fold aces post flop in a small blind versus big blind battle. There's just too much distrust going on in those kind of spots where people are just raising flops too light and getting the money in really lightly to ever think about folding hand like two aces unless we're against like the most passive of passive players. This has been pretty cool. I've, uh, like I said, I really enjoyed like focusing on one topic. I kind of have like ADD in a sense where it's not diagnosed, but I really have a hard time sometimes focusing on one thing. So this has been cool to actually sit here and force myself, um, force myself to remain focused on you know one key concept, which in this case has been position. Like I said, I'm really not sure yet what I'm going to be doing uh, with the next video, uh, but. Uh, I'll think of something cool for the fourth and f final part of the series. So you should never um, say you're going to make a four-part series until you know what the fourth part is. You know, that should be like rule number one of any business, I guess, is like don't guarantee something unless you know you can actually do it. So I'll think of something cool. This is just obviously a really bad board to do any make any kind of move on. And... Arnold with his strong bet, and then he snap checks the turn. So uh, he's usually pretty weak when he does this, like a draw or like 4x. Um, when he like bets the flop small and then like snap checks. Okay, so yeah, he was really weak. Uh, he just had ace high on the turn. Um, and Humperdinck, I guess, had king x, 3-6. Okay, so he correctly bet the turn. It's actually... I mean, not like a really impressive value bet by any means, but obviously, um, obviously a correct bet. When his opponent checked the flop quickly, he, I mean, the turn quickly, he got all the information he knew to realize his hand was probably the best, and he took advantage of that. Here, I'll just make it slightly bigger because I'm OOP. I mean, the only person I'm really worried about is Dan Finn. And, like, when I flop, Middle set. I really don't have to worry about too much. Yay! Keep folding when I flop sets. Poker is fun for everyone. If you haven't checked out the Prolod Freeman wrap, please make sure to check it out. Uh, here in a multi-way pot, not going to see bet the six high. Ha! Uh, yeah, just not going to see about the 6 high. Oh, free card. Might have got me there. We'll have to see what happens on the turn. I'm 
obviously be stacking off on this board. Uh, I'm going to call because he can be incorrectly betting a five, seeing how I check back the flop. Um, I'm not exactly what I'm going to do. I know he can slow play. That's the only problem. So I'm not really sure what's going to happen on most rivers. That's one that should slow him down a little bit, which is cool because I get to see my free show down, and I'm really hoping he has 5x here. Uh, unfortunately, every time I want to prove a point, <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, well, he didn't squeeze nines against a cold caller. That's kind of a weak just call. Uh, just over call there, pre-flop. Um, I was so sure his range was like mostly 5x there uh, that I really didn't even consider bluffing the river, but I certainly could have once he checks a diamond. Um, I'm really not sure if this guy can fold. Uh, and my line doesn't really represent a flush draw too much. Uh, so I like the way that I played the hand. I mean, I, I paw controlled the flop. A lot of, I mean, it's it's like the perfect, that's the tough thing about making these videos that people don't realize, is like, that's like the most perfect example ever if he has like ace five. <laughs> and it sucks when he has nines, but he's going to have like some sort of five X combo or like betting a bluff a lot of the times on the turn. That That's a great example. That's just, people are going to watch this video and the ones that won't ever improve at poker are going to watch this video and go, yeah, you're wrong, Spinda. But if we're thinking about his range as a whole and not just like the, that was like the top of his range was like pocket nines. Um, uh, if we think about his range as a whole, we played that hand really well. We got our free card on the flop. We improved against a lot of his range, whether it was ace high, king high, queen high, jack high, or five X or twos, threes, or fours. We improved against a ton of his range. Uh, and we had him lead a probably what I would guess is a pretty wide range there on the turn into us. Uh, and unfortunately just at the top of his range and people are just so results oriented all the time that they think that like, that's the hand he's always going to show us is like pocket nines, which is just so far from the case. Um, sorry to ramble. And if anyone feels like I hurt their feelings, uh, tough noogies. It's really cool how like I flop sets and they fold the flop. And then I flop over pairs with a flush draw, and they have big hands. This Arnold guy is my new hero. I uh, I think just anyone with like their name in uh, their poker name like that, I'm just auto labeling them a fish. It's one of the reasons why I picked my name too, though, because I thought it would like give me a, like a fishy type feeling from my opponents. But I guess when your name gets out there enough, people understand that you're not really a fish. Um, it's interesting, whatever this guy checked on the flop, uh, we both checked uh, Arnold here, um, checked fairly quickly, uh, which makes me think that this guy should, definitely should have bet. Uh, and this is why I like being out of position stuff. I, I completed ace nine, but, um, you know, oh, ship it. Damn, that's half a du double junior bacon cheeseburger. I want the whole thing. We'll see if we can't get it on this spot. Uh, I'm definitely done after this orbit. Then I'll bring my PT stats in, and we'll maybe look at um, my late position stats versus my early position stats, and we'll see how much of a difference it really was, because I'm, I'm guessing it's a huge difference. Um, just from, you know... Oh, darn it. Well, I meant to hit sit up, um, obviously, on the wrong kind of table, uh, but that'll give me some time to load up. Mr. Poker Tracker. It's going to flash on the screen here real quick. I apologize. Deal with it. Uh, and we'll just play the last few hands here and hopefully playing them in position. Uh, let's see. This is a spot where like these guys are doing an awesome job of never folding. Um... He leads, so this is some information I gained from my opponent that he's probably leading pretty weak. Uh, it's definitely gonna raise this up. So when he calls, he obviously has either a draw or like a weak top pair hand. The draw comes in, which really strengthens his hand range a ton. Um, so now he has like nine x, and I'm never getting him to fold it, especially after I check the turn um, or jack x. So I'm never getting him to fold it, and he never has a worse hand except like. If sometimes he has a 3x, which would have been awesome because I got my free card, but we know it's not going to work out that way in the video. Yeah, he has the nut flush, and we can see how being out of position got him like no value out of his hand there. Um, congratulations. You won a flop raise with the nut flush. So, like, it's great though. Like, we get to analyze the turn card and play pretty much perfectly against what we think his hand range is. Uh, darn, I didn't see how short this guy was in the big blind. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have raised pre flop. Or. 
this guy's just so loose, I probably shouldn't be opening Ace-5 offsuit. I should be, um, and here I'm just going to fold. Uh, it's really reverse implied odd spot if I happen to, yeah, whatever. Uh, just out of position against this guy. Let's see if he has a flush draw again and he min bet it. This could be interesting on the river. We're getting some really deep stack play with five whole big blinds behind. Yes. Impressive. So obviously I'm not going to be opening this hand here. And what I'll do is check out the stats and bring up the old position tab for today. It's really easy when this is the only no limit I've played today. And this really could not have worked out better for the video since. Um, from under the gun, I played 14% of my hands. Uh, from under the gun plus one, I played 20%. From the cutoff, I played 34%. And from the button, I played... Uh, yeah, I'm out. Thank you. I played... Uh, what did I play? I played 43%. This is pretty cool. So uh, this is definitely what I wanted. Um, you can see how I just played the majority of my hands in the button. I played 42% of 70 hands, whatever. So I played somewhere around, what is that, 30 hands from the button, and then I played 14% of 30 hands from under the gun. So I played somewhere around like four, like five hands from under the gun. So you can see just how big of a uh, change that is. Probably could have played even a little bit tighter out of the blinds. Um, obviously I lost that one big pot that I'm really not going to fret over, uh, just because I think if I did a poker stove analysis of his hand range in that spot that I'm really not getting my money in too poorly uh, the majority of the time. And... Uh, so I'm just not going to worry about spots like that. There's just different spots to think about in poker where you flop. Like, I had a crazy image already. I've been opening a ton of pots. I flopped kings with a flush draw on a monotone board, and I got it in. And I just don't think I'm ever going to be wrong. I had, like, 30% equity in that spot anyway for getting it in. So it's, it's like, not really even that bad, to be honest, uh, especially with my image and the fact that he can have a lot of worse hands. Um, and he can even be bluff-raising the flop every now and then. Uh, but overall, I felt like this was a cool video. Um... I got a lot out of it. I mean, I raised a ton of hands from the button. Uh, you know, you saw me raising like seven deuce suited, which I'm not going to say is like obviously a, an optimal play. I should have hold. I should have folded. The hand I didn't like that I raised was this five six offsuit. After seeing how loose Bryn was uh, and match leader, I don't think I'm ever stealing the blinds enough there to make it profitable. Plus, my hand's going to be just not going to make an, enough strength post flop. I should really be like. I would much rather be opening like king x here instead of like five six because I think I'm going to be going to showdown a lot with these guys, and obviously the king high uh, fares a lot better. It rates a lot better in that spot. Uh, obviously, though, I mean, opening suited cards, and like the, I don't regret the 4-6 suited at all, because it just has a lot more options, uh, the 5-6 suited. And the 5-6 offset just seems pretty bad. Okay, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed part tres, part three of the four-part, I guess, uh, video. Uh, this part was all about position, and stay tuned, I guess. You'll have to see what the next part is. But once again, guys, this was Spender from GrinderSchool.com. Take it easy.